This is our 13th screencast, and now we're really getting into the detail of uh, topic 3, or the experimental methods. Uh, so I'm going to use this one to go into uh, a little bit more detail about these three methods. So this is pressure, conductivity, and spectroscopy. So if you paid attention to the last one, you'll recognise these as in situ measurements. And I didn't really cover them in a lot of detail, I just said that they are possible. Now, uh, this is probably going to be a long and arduous screencast, uh, for which I do apologise. If it makes you feel any better, it's quite difficult for me to figure out and to put together as well. Um, there's quite a lot of detail in it. Uh, you can, however, just skip through some of it. Uh, there's going to be a lot of derivations and equations. So if you're happy with using equations, you can probably just skip through the slides. That will be fine. Uh, if you really want to go into the detail, feel free to watch all of it or just skip to the part that you want to know more about. Um, again, these links on the bottom are quite useful for just navigating around and maybe cutting through if I'm um, recapping things a bit too many times for you. Uh, so let's just start with pressure. Uh, pressure, yeah, where do we start with pressure all the time? Ideal gas law, PV equals NRT. This is one of those equations that should be tattooed on the inside of your eyeballs by the end of your first term of uh, being an undergraduate chemist. And we can see that pressure is proportional to the number of molecules. There are two here, there are, count them up, five here. So if we say that there's a change of number of moles in a reaction, uh, that is equal to plus three. There are three moles appearing. Um, so our change in pressure is going to be proportional to that change in number of moles. Um, so it stands to reason in this case, the pressure will increase. In fact, it will just over double. Uh, you do have to scale that up proportionally to the actual number of moles involved to get a real pressure out. Uh, this is just kind of an ideal situation where we've got, say, two moles here and five here. It reflects the stoichiometry perfectly. Uh, but in this case, we're going to mostly focus on this other reaction here. So I'm going to change it up for 2NO plus chlorine gas going to NOCl. Uh, two of those. Uh, so we have three molecules on this side, two molecules on this side, so this stands to reason that the pressure is going to go down across this reaction. So we're going to be interested in two values, one pressure and another one dp by dt, or the change of pressure over time, and later we're going to break that pressure up into multiple values. So pressure isn't just what we measure, it can also be terms of partial pressure. Um, so what's the first thing we know? So the ideal gas law tells us pressure is proportional to the number of moles. Uh, that tells us something else. It means we can actually split pressure, the total pressure that we measure, that is, if we stick a thermometer on here or any kind of device to measure pressure, we can break that total pressure into two components. In this case, the pressure of NO and the pressure of Cl gas. So here we got two molecules of those. So two thirds of that pressure comes from uh, NO here. Uh, one third of the pressure comes from Cl. That's fine, that's how partial pressure works. Uh, and so if we take a rate of change of these pressures, we can get up an expression like this. So this is kind of the advantage of mathematics. Uh, we can just differentiate these and they all add up exactly the same. Coffee being very important for doing this subject. Uh, <coughs> that's not the end of the story. As we progress through the reaction, reactants start appearing. So we actually need to add this on as well. So a rate of change of NO plus the rate of change of Cl plus the rate of change of our product is what contributes to the total pressure. Uh, so you can see in this case, two out of two of the pressure, 100% of the pressure comes from the product. But halfway through, however, there's going to be a mixture. This is only two for time equals zero, the very start of our reaction. And this is only true for time equals uh, infinity. Now, I don't literally mean infinite time. This is a placeholder for when the reaction has completed and everything has converted to products. It may be an entirely hypothetical point. It may be the end of the reaction. It may be actually in an hour's time rather than infinity, but it's just a bit of notation. Don't get too bogged down by it. Uh, so at any point in time, this holds true. All three components are going together. Uh, so this is our reaction to NO plus Cl2 goes to 2 NOCl, and we need to derive a rate for it. So the rate is as this equation says. Uh, so let's just remember how we do this. Uh, our rate of change of this is a given number. Don't get confused, that's just kind of a number. This is also a number, 
that's also a number. Uh, and then we just need to equate them together. And how do we do that? Well, uh, if they're disappearing as reactants, we have the negatives in. If they're appearing as a product, we put the positives in. So we'll remember that from the very first topic we were discussing. And we also have to divide through by the stoichiometries because there's two moles of NO disappearing for every mole of Cl that's disappearing. So NO is disappearing at twice the rate of Cl or Cl is disappearing at half the rate of NO. So this is half the rate of this. And the same holds true for that side. Uh, and remember, we can also add them up to get the total pressures. Now, this is not to say that rate is equal to this. Um, this is not true. Right? That is not equal. This. So in case you just get these two equations or expressions mixed up, uh, they are not entirely related. One is telling us uh, what the rate is equal to. So how do these relate to each other? Uh, this one is telling us what they all add to to get the observed pressure, the total pressure of the entire system. That's less to do with equating to rate. We still have to do a little bit of fiddling about to get that equal to it. And that's kind of what we're going to do. So assume for a moment, let's stick some numbers in. Our rate of change of the partial pressure of NO here, our reactant is minus 60 pascals per second. Now I've picked the SI units there of pascals for pressure. Uh, you might see other ones, atmospheres for instance, um, they're roughly equivalent, but how about a percent out? Is a, atmosphere is a very good one at this, you need the atmospheric pressure. Tor, you often see on thermometers and pressure gauges. It's a very Americanized unit from what I can tell. And there's also millimeters of mercury, which is something you might see in weather prediction for some reason. Um, it comes from thermometers that would actually, a pressure would be able to move mercury by a certain number of millimeters. Uh, and obviously time I'm using is per seconds, but you might see per minute uh, and per hour, even per day if it's a really, really long election. But the important thing really is don't get too bogged down by units. If possible, try to convert them into these standard ones. It just makes things a lot easier for you. Uh, so Pascals per second. So if we want to insert this into this expression, we can start figuring out that the rate of change of these must be related to it. So we have, say, a half, well, it's minus a half, we'll bring this down from here, and times the, this value, which we have a value for. It's minus 60. And I'll be really anal and put the units in those on pascals per second. And that is equal to minus this. So we'll bring that down. We'll just focus on this one for now. Uh, so we can actually work out this value. Remember, this is just a number, uh, and we can figure it out. So how are we going to deal with this? Well, first, the negatives will cancel out. And then, well, we can, this is just a very simple sum. It's a half times minus 60 watts minus 30 pascals per second. There we go. D, PCL2 of D, T. Okay, so we can actually start working out what the, in principle, the rate of change of each individual component can be. We can do the same for um, the product as well. But I'll skip over doing that and just say, these are the answers. So if this is minus 60, this one is minus 30. That's plus 60. Now think about that actually gels with our intuition as well, because this is disappearing at twice the rate of that. So it should be double the number. There you go, 60 is twice 30, or more specifically, minus 60 is double minus 30. And this is appearing uh, with kind of a one-to-one -one here. So this is appearing at the exact same rate as this because that would nice little one-to-one -one correspondence there. So it is plus 60 pascals per second. Now, our total pressure uh, is a combination of all three pressures or the rate of change of pressure is equal to the rates of these. So we could add all of these together. That's minus 60 minus 30 plus 60 pascals per second and I'm sure you can add that up and you realize that cancels that cancels minus 30 pascals per second so the rate of change of this reaction should be minus 30 pascals per second maybe at a particular point so that may be an initial rate for instance so 
let's just kind of review how the pressure works here. Remember, there's a direct correspondence between pressure and molecules. It's not mass, it is the number of molecules. PV equals NRT doesn't say anything about mass or anything like that. It's all, the, in ideal conditions at least, it's all about the discrete entities, the number of molecules. Uh, so when you can get that relationship in your head, pressure becomes great to follow reaction rates by. So we also need to remember partial rates, uh, partial pressures and kind of partial rates of reaction. So our total pressure is equal to the components inside. So remember that can be as many as possible. Atmospheric pressure, for instance, it's 70% nitrogen, uh, it's like 0 0.7 atmospheres N2, uh, 0.3 atmospheres of oxygen-ish, uh, and then kind of rounding errors is argon and carbon dioxide or water vapor and so on. Uh, so those are like partial pressures. They would all add up to atmospheric pressure. And so the rate of change of these can add up exactly the same way. So once we can get a rate of change, the individual components, we can get a total pressure, or we can work backwards if we want. Uh, now let's go to conductivity. Uh, conductivity, as I said, works if something is splitting off into charges, or charges are coming together and getting rid of. Uh, so let's have a look at this reaction. For instance, if we stuck an electrode in here, positive and a negative, uh, well, those are fairly neutral molecules. They don't carry a charge. They're a little bit polar. Maybe there'll be a small amount of conductance in there. You're not going to be conductivity measurement. Uh, but you stuck those electrodes in this. Well, there's H plus, there's Cl minus. Oh, you're going to get a lot of conductivity there. The, the electrons are going to go. Oh, I'm going to love that. Um, yeah, that um, set of reagents there and fly all over the place. They're going to like that. You're going to get a high conductivity measurement. And so what do we need to know about this reaction? We need to know its rate. So this rate, um, it's going to be a second order reaction-ish. So there are going to be two components to it uh, raised to a certain power because we don't really know the order, but we're going to guess. Uh, and we notice that H2O is the solvent, so that's H2O everywhere. And therefore, first order approximation applies. So go back and make sure you can understand the first order approximation to see what's going on here. We're saying that K obs is equal to K times H2O. And it doesn't really matter what that power is raised to, this is kind of constant across the reaction. So K obs is a nice little, I've uh, flicked a little bit too hard and sent itself ahead. K obs is a good um, approximation. So this is gonna probably go by first order, maybe. I don't think there's a good theoretical reason this M would be different uh, than one. So it's probably gonna be first order. Uh, so let's go ahead and see what we can do with it. So we need to figure out the concentration of this. And that is our starting product. We want to get a rate based on that. Trouble is, conductivity is measuring these products. Oh, okay, that's a bit of a problem. Because remember, that rate is really uh, equal to K times any reagent. We can't stick a product in there uh, and get a rate out. The rate's constant is always times a reagent. But we can work it out. We can just say that that starting concentration at time equals zero. It's that little label down there. Um, we just subtract from that. What does it turn into? It, well, it breaks apart and it turns into one of these and it then produces one of these. So if we said, oh well, we take the that reactant and we subtract that Cl minus from it, um, then we get the reactant at time t. Uh, but unfortunately, conductivity will measure these positive ions as well. So we need to add them together and half. So half of these added together gets us this. So try and satisfy yourself. It might take a while to visualize it. Satisfy yourself that this is true. Uh, so we get that equation on the top here. There we go. For any time t, we have well, the initial concentration, subtract this. But again, conductivity is only measuring the these are charged ions. So what we want is we want to subtract 
uh, and get rid of this. Uh, so we want to work out that in terms of ions as well. So we do it on this equation here. Um, and that is equal to the timing at the end plus these at the end. So it's as if it's entirely converted to these um, ions, the concentration side of it. Uh, and thankfully, at the very end, we can say that this is zero. It's entirely converted. The reaction has gone to completion. So we can get an expression for um, that reactant at time zero, and it is equal to half of Cl plus H plus. Or, in fact, it is equal to the entire concentration of Cl minus, because it has converted from one to at least one of the other. Okay. Um, and so we can substitute those in and get an expression like this. So just to show you where these are all, all going to, I've kind of added some colours in here to help track it. You can see that we've got, well, that comes down to here. Um, this substitutes for this, so it comes down to here. And therefore we get an expression for all this concentration at any particular time, just in terms of what those ions are, those charged species great bit of mathematics that helps us deal with conductivity measurements. So there it is again at the top. And we are also now interested in conductivity. So conductivity is measured, um, this Greek letter kappa. We're not going to go into too much detail about how we get to it or what it's measured in. We just need to know it's proportional to these concentrations. So we can kind of directly substitute this in because we know if they're directly proportional, their rate of change same. So if we do um, d, k, uh, d kappa by dt, for instance, that should be kind of the equivalent of any kind of charged species by dt as well. Actually, I'll just stick that as an h plus. Or maybe I will. <laughs> Actually, I will draw that out and draw it as an h plus. There we go. So if they're proportional, their rates of change should be the same. So we can actually start directly substituting values for k, for kappa, um, into these equations and this is how we do it. So at time infinity, at the end of the reaction, we have the conductivity at the very end and then we subtract um, it for any arbitrary uh, time t. So there's an expression for what the concentration of the reactant is in terms of just its conductivity measurement. That's great. So you can see how this tracks through here. We add this into, uh, sorry, we substitute this for kappa and it comes into here and we can actually do the same we replace that t for infinity and do the same for this side uh, so yeah let me just clear some of this off so you can see it a little easier there we go uh, so now we've got the rate is equal to k obs times this we can actually substitute this in to here now so what you can see is we're now just swapping out um, our concentration of our reactant for this conductivity measurement. So k obs uh, times the two differences of conductivity raised to a particular power m because we're we don't know the order of the reaction yet, although it's probably going to be first. So there it is again, just at the top. Uh, we're going to integrate this now. So this is a little bit of a a tricky integration to do. Um, it's going to involve a standard integral, but I'll just show you how we get to it. Uh, one of the ways of kind of thinking about integration is uh, think of these as individual values you can move around just like um, just like normal numbers, really. So in principle, you can bring that to this side, uh, and then it would integrate. And you can well, we're going to integrate with respect to kappa, so we need this on that side. And so what we end up with is one over. Oops, I've written that as k. There we go. One over that. Uh, d kappa equals to the k obs dt. So that's come over to that side. This has come over to that side. And then we integrate them. So we're integrating an expression like this. Now, if we assume first order kinetics, um, there's m equals to 1. We can just ignore it and get rid of it. And it gets us this expression, which we need to do from a standard integral. So here's what the integration expression looks like, but that actually then calculates to this. So we get it from a standard. I'm not going to bother deriving this. If you really, really want to look this up, I'm sure there's maths help. 
uh, out there online or on YouTube, someone will have derived this somewhere. It's a bit intense, probably. So th this is what we've got. It's a log um, logarithmic value of the different measurements we can do. That's the conductivity at the end of the reaction, conductivity at a particular time, and that is equal to minus K ops times T, which is what you kind of expect from a sort of a first order reaction anyway. It is the rate constant times time. So that means if we plot a log of this conductivity measurement uh, versus time, we should get a straight line. And look, here's some data. Here's the conductance going up uh, gradually over time. We plot a log of that. There we go. Straight down. So there should be, we get the gradient out as k minus k. So that gets us our rate constant from this data. So what we're trying to show here is that we don't necessarily need to plot concentration here. We can just find something that concentration is directly proportional to. So pressure is the same, conductivity is the same, and when we move to spectroscopy and moment, we'll see that absorbance can be used as the same thing as well. So this does not necessarily need to be concentration if it is directly proportional to it. So let's just review all this. Conductivity, that measurement of conductivity, our kappa value there, uh, is related to the concentration of ions. So concentration uh, is pretty much proportional to conductivity. We can use it in kinetics measurements. So we can fiddle with some equations, to derivations up back there. I'm not going to review them all. So we can get concentrations just in terms of those ions. So we have an H plus and Cl minus, for instance, that something's broken out into doesn't matter what it is. Uh, so that means we can then replace this with conductivity. That's pretty good, isn't it? Uh, so we can use conductivity at time zero or any particular arbitrary time and time equals infinity at the end of the reaction to start plugging values in to get real numbers. And if we assume first order kinetics, a plot of that value there, the log of conductivity at two different times, the difference between them versus time should be linear. Okay, so first order kinetics, Remember, something will be like a curve, and then when you log it, let's, see, let's just make it as X and Y graph. It should be negative. Right, so the spectroscopy. We're going to look at this reaction, that bromine plus hydrogen going to 2 HBr. So, remember, well, let's just write out a quick rate equation. You should be able to do this yourself as well. That's going to be D. Br2 by dt, and it's going to be negative because that is disappearing, and it's going to be equal to well, negative of h2 because it is disappearing, dt, and it's going to be equal to positive of dhbr by dt, uh, but half because remember, two of these are appearing, so that's going to be double the rate of any of these. Incidentally, if you were to add those together, add them instead. Uh, it would equal to dh, oh, my handwriting, dhbr by dt. Those rates should be added together and they become equal. So, so what's happening on a macroscopic level? That's um, what's happening in terms of maths and individual molecules. On the macroscopic level, we're seeing a change in colour because bromine. Uh, if you've ever seen it before, it's a very bright red brownie gas. It's um, very volatile. It's certainly an interesting one to see in the lab because the, as soon as you open the top, it starts smoking at you. It's very, very volatile and very darkly, intensely coloured. So if you start reacting that, that colour is going to go away. We're going to go from this dark brownish uh, vessel to quite a almost transparent one. So over time, that colour is going to change. So if we want to measure that colour, say with spectroscopy we find a point on the spectrum where bromine um, very much intensely absorbs and then it will reduce it will go down and down and down uh, so pretty much like this it's a beautifully cheesy powerpoint animation there you can see that all the bromines are disappearing and converting to hbr and the intensity of that light is increasing the wavelength isn't just the intensity so we're not shifting a peak in frequency space where well, they're just the intensity is changing and this comes down to something called the Beer-Lambert law 
Uh, no. We do call it the Beer Lambert Law. Uh, I think Americans call it the Beer Law and Europeans call it the Lambert Law or the Lambert Law, uh, which kind of tells you everything you need to know about scientific culture across countries. Um, but we like the compromise of calling it the Beer Lambert Law. Uh, and it says this, the intensity of the light coming through uh, divided by the intensity that it starts with is equal to 10 raised to the power of E, C, and L. Uh, and now, well, I keep saying E, it's not, it's um, epsilon, Greek letter. So that's an emissivity coefficient or an absorption coefficient. Uh, it's just a measure of how strongly a molecule absorbs. Uh, C is the concentration and L is the path length. So that path length is, how wide is the sample? Uh, there is a lot more justification about this from the microscopic level, but we don't need to worry about it just now. Uh, basically saying absorption will increase if you have more sample to, that the light passes through. Obviously, uh, if it has to pass through 10 molecules to get from A to B, it'll absorb you know, half as much if it had to pass through 20 molecules going from A to you know, twice as far. So multiplying those all together gets us that value. So this is quite a useful law to remember um, because it's the basis of most analytical spectroscopy, certainly the best basis of most kinetic spectroscopy. So let's just watch that again. I spent some time on this animation. I may as well show it twice. So you can see it's converting. The intensity of this is increasing. So we want to say that absorption uh, is um, decreasing over this. So we want to convert this to a linear equation because this exponential one is not very good. So what you can see is if you take logs of both these sides, like base 10 logs specifically, you get 10, not on me, uh, you get log of this is equal to minus that absorption coefficient times concentration times the path length. And we actually start defining this term called absorption uh, as equal to negative of that log. And this gets us what you usually see if you write down the Beer Lambert law. So that is equal to again the Beer Lambert law. Uh, as we as chemists are interested in it. Now, if you look at some physics, especially spectroscopy of the atmosphere, they tend to use this version and multiple components to it. Uh, chemists, we're kind of mathematically illiterate creatures, aren't we? So we like this nice and straight version. This tells us that absorption is directly proportional to concentration. So, so I honestly say X. So any particular species X, the, the amount that that absorption figure, when we take the look of this, is directly proportional to it. So usually this is the number that a spectrometer spits out at us. So if you're using an instrument, you get absorption. If you're trying to do it manually uh, and work out light intensities, you've got to work out this and it's exponential. It's, yeah. But get a computer to do it for you, basically. The spectrometer will spit out A and then that is directly proportional to concentration. So if you're doing fairly straightforward kinetics, once again, a plot of absorption versus time will probably do something like this. If we're doing that, bromine going to HBr reaction, the absorption is going to go down. We plot a log of that, log of absorption versus time. It'll be a straight line. Brilliant. So let's just kind of review this spectroscopy. It's been a long screencast. We're on 28 minutes. Bloody hell. Uh, the method for spectroscopy. The molecules individually absorb light, so the absorption must change as a reaction proceeds. Um, we're really interested in kind of the macroscopic concentration of these, so those are proportional to each other. And then there's the Beer Lambert law. Remember, this is another one of those tattooed on your eyeballs uh, equations you need to know. Uh, absorption is equal to a coefficient of extinction or absorption coefficient times the concentration times the path length. Um, there's some interesting things about the units of this um, since length and, well, Length is in, obviously, in kind of meters or it's a distance. Concentration is in something per distance cubed. Those cancel out and you get distance minus cubed. Uh, so that has to be 
in scale of the units that has distance squared in it, which is kind of weird. Um, what does that represent? We'll maybe cover that in a separate video. Um, so as long as you can deal with the units of that, you should be fine. Uh, so therefore, absorption versus time can be used instead of concentration. So absorption of time. You're likely to get a graph like this spat out of a spectrometer at you, and you can use that data kind of raw instead of trying to convert to concentration directly. So let's just review the whole thing now that we're hitting half an hour of video. Uh, pressure, mostly the centers around the fact PV equals NRT. Okay. On your eyeballs, this equation. Uh, pressure is directly proportional to vol uh, the number of moles, so you need to remember pressure and the fact that you can add then partial pressures together. Uh, once you can deal with that, you can start substituting pressures and partial pressures for concentration and get kinetic data that way. Conductivity, this is obviously a little bit more complicated. That derivation, I think, was quite intense uh, by some standards. So those ions, the charged ions, are proportional to conductivity. So you need to do a little bit more, but ultimately you can start taking conductivity measurements and uh, substituting it. So that conductivity there versus time is going to be proportional to your rate of reaction as well. And absorption uh, in spectroscopy, uh, that absorbs that A value, uh, and we have to remember that that is minus log of So these incident lights, that's the actual intensity of light that you measure. A is the number that a spectrometer will actually spit out at you because it's very convenient. Uh, if you hand build a spectrometer, by the way, you have to do that calculation yourself. But A is the one that's proportional to concentration. You can, once again, use absorption versus time. So that kind of um, concludes our three main methods of in-situ measurement. So these are a couple of examples in a bit of intense detail, certainly. Uh, well, I would hope it was useful for you uh, if you sat through it. Um, you don't need to obviously memorize all of this. These are just examples for how you go about it. So certainly if you are not very strong with maths, go through these derivations and try and figure them out yourself. Um, yeah, links uh, on this little table of contents and menu just underneath my face here that you can go back over them again. Um, oh, see you in a lecture and we will do some problem solving on this kind of thing.